782, and expectedly we get zero at that joint because there's now a pin here, which means there can be no moment transfer to that location. You apply a moment here, this joint just rotates. So let's see if this is what SAP gives us. <coughs> All right, so you can see now there's no moment at this joint being transferred through. So that's zero as expected. We have 783, top of this joint, 782, close enough. And we have 1304 now at the base of the structure. So once again, we can just start releasing these corresponding to one hinges form, and we can check as we do each push to see if our hand calc is matching up correctly. So if we did this analysis and took it one step further, we would have found the next hinge is forming at D. So I can now come back to this member. I can do assign, frame, releases partial fixity. I had the end of the member released. I now have to also release the base. So now I have both of these. So this column is formed <coughs> kind of a full, fully hinged mechanism where it no longer has any lateral stiffness. The top and bottom are both uh, now pins essentially. They have no moment capacity which means this thing will just rotate rigidly now. So I can run this again now, look at the next one, and just check to make sure our moments are right. So hand analysis says this would be 1125. 1876. And this would be, once again, zero. We have no moment capacity at that location. So here we go. You can now see there's no moments whatsoever in this member, which is as expected. No more moment capacity in this column. Up at this joint, we see a value 1126. 1125 actually, which corresponds to our 1125 here, so that's good. At the base, we see 1875. We have 1876 here, close enough. One kip photo So that's good. What happens now as we do our last things check? Find the next one forms at A. So we now go to this member. We can assign, frame, releases, and partial fixity. And I want to release just at the base, at A, it's the base of this column. So now my frame looks like this. I've got a pin, a pin, and a pin. So the only moment capacity I've left is this joint up here. So if I look at the moments for this, You get 3,000 there, there's no longer any moments at the base. And there we have it. We have the moments here, 3,000 at that pin. This gives you a good idea of how you can walk through this sequentially just by looking at these sequences of elastic analysis. And that's essentially what we're doing. We're applying this 100 kip unit load. And we're seeing how moments develop in this frame if these different members have hinges and locations. Okay. So now it'll be interesting to actually do the pushover analysis of this frame. So let's go ahead and define the hinges that we used for this problem. So we can define section properties, hinge properties. I believe we spent some time talking about this last time. We're interested in adding new property. User defined. <coughs> I'm interested in a moment three hinge. Moment three three was our dominant moment for this. And so recall that we're now looking at essentially scaling this curve to fit our plastic hinge. And we're going to use a moment rotation curve. So SAP lets you do a moment curvature curve 
but you can see it just basically asks you for the plastic hinge length, and then it converts that moment curvature curve into a moment rotation curve. You can do that by hand as part of the process anyway, so I don't really see a need for the moment curvature. I think that's more of an internal thing that you can have SAP auto-generate stuff, which I don't know if I'd ever trust. But moment rotation. And so we had a yield moment. I'm sure we're on the tips of the feet, we are. Of 62.75, this is our plastic moment for this hinge. We're assuming it's symmetric, so we don't have to enter it in this one direction. We can see for a scale factor associated with 62.75, so just one time of that, we have zero rotation. This makes sense, right? Our plastic hinge is like a rusted hinge. It has to overcome a certain amount of internal friction before any rotation can start to develop. So any moment less than 62.75, you're gonna have no rotation at all. This moment's just fixed. But once you exceed this value, then you're actually gonna have rotation starting to form. After this, we said this was a perfectly plastic hinge. We're constantly now at the plastic moment. We said SAP also lets you include some hardening of this hinge, so you can give this instead of, let's say, 1.0, so it's this perfectly flat line. You can give it some additional stiffness here, rotational stiffness. But now we can also uh, define the plastic rotation capacity of this, and if you did the analysis correctly, you should have come up with a plastic rotation of 0 0.077 radians. So now I've got essentially a hinge that has zero, zero as a starting point. It's zero rotation up until the plastic moment. And then it stays at this plastic moment until it reaches its uh, plastic rotational capacity. SEP also likes to have these other portions after you have that failure point. Uh, now hinges, let's say, that have degradation, so on and so forth. In this case, I'm just going to set these to be something larger. So by hand, let's say, look to see my results, and I'll cut off any results after, let's say, this point. But I'll just give SAP some values here so it can complete its curve. If you're doing, let's say, performance-based design, you can also set other things in here. I haven't talked about that in this class, but these are also options that let you look at your analysis and see when you have certain performance states hit. But that's all we need for now. We just have this <coughs> moment three hinge. We'll just call this guy plastic hinge. So I can now select these members, assign, frame, hinges. Hinge property, I'm interested in plastic hinge. I want a relative distance of zero. This would be at the base of the frame. So add this in, and also relative distance of one. This will be at the top of the column. So hit OK. You'll see now SAP is defining the hinges in these different locations. <coughs> so now we want to push over this frame. This is where you get to do two different worlds. One is called force control, one is called displacement control. So in this case, we're just pushing this frame over, and so we're essentially holding it and dragging it along. Therefore, we want to use displacement control. Force control will be, let's say, you're running earthquake through this frame, and you give it some acceleration time history, and it'll take any of your fixed points, it'll run accelerations through those fixed points, and it'll develop, based on the equations of motion, the accelerations and subsequently the forces and displacements at each of the joints associated with that. But we're just doing a pushover analysis, so we're not concerned with, let's say, running some arbitrary ground motion through this frame. We just want to pull this thing over and see when it fails. Right? So we can't just push with a constant force, because what happens uh, with our force displacement curve? Well, from our hand calc, at least, we expected it to do something like this. if you run this in force control? Well, it's fine. Up through here, apply this force, apply this force, no problems. Hinge forms, no problems. Hinge forms, no problems. Hinge forms, no problems. <coughs> Hinge forms, and now what, what's happening? You have zero stiffness left of this frame. And so if you try to do force control after this, 
what's going to happen? It has no concept now of how do I follow this path of this force displacement curve. It's just going to keep pushing with 837 kips, which happen to be this value up here for this plane. And it won't know what to do. It has no concept of there's a, displa there's a displacement space I have to be monitoring after this point. Right? Because after this point, up until these hinges are all formed, this is essentially a force-based problem. We're increasing the lateral force on the structure, and we're seeing how much rotation the hinges do we get, how much displacement does our structure get. But once we have this final hinge form, we move from a force-based problem into a displacement-based problem. We want to know how much displacement capacity is left in the frame. And SAP doesn't know how to switch that on the fly. Right? That's part of the analysis that you're defining. It doesn't know that implicitly. All it knows is that you want to apply a force of 837 kips. That's what you want to do, or 1,000 kips. Right? What happens if you, look, if you tell SAP, I want you to load up to 1,000 kips? You don't know that you've done this analysis by hand ahead of time. You don't know that the ultimate force here is 837. If you say 1,000, it doesn't know how to follow this curve anymore because 1,000 doesn't follow on this. And it's just going to throw it over someplace, and they'll fall into infinity, and you'll never get a solution. Right? It can't solve a displacement-based problem with forces if you're trying to do those different methods. So we want to do a displacement-based analysis of this frame. And a tricky thing with displacements is you have to actually fix portions of the frame in order to do that. If I come back to my undeformed shape, I now need to take these joints, I need to fix them in whatever direction I want to move them in. Because what SAP does for displacement control is it takes fixed points and it moves them manually. And because it's using the stiffness method, it's resolving everything based off joint displacements. So you're essentially telling SAP ahead of time, you know the displacements for these joints. So move these joints, then resolve everything based off that. Right. So if you can't tell SAP ahead of time what these joints are going to be doing, then you have a problem. So in order to do that, you have to fix these joints. So I'm going to assign joint restraint. I'm just going to restrict translation in the x direction. This is the direction I'm pulling the frame in. Now I want to define. Well, first thing, let's get rid of the 100 kip unit load here. Assign joint load forces, push, delete existing loads. Because we're no longer looking at that unit push, we just want to do the pushover analysis of the frame. So now, for each of these, I can assign joint loads, but instead of applying forces, I will apply displacements. So apply displacements. These are going to be under the push <coughs> category here. And it's going to use a value of 1 here. So this is a unit displacement. I can scale this up in another way, which I'll show you in a second. So I just like to have this arbitrary value of 1. This is a unit value of 1 foot, but you can scale this up and down to whatever you like. Yes. It's one foot total, or like they're both moving. They're both together. moving one foot. Oh, okay. They're moving together, right? Which is what makes sense for our frame. The tops and bottom, or the tops of your frame at each joint, they're moving together regardless. You don't have this disparity and displacement between the two. You would if you had axial deformation of the frame in place, but we don't have axial deformation of the beam, so there's nothing to worry about there. So now I want to do, define, let's say, an analysis case. So at first we define load patterns. That gave us, let's say, dead load and push. Now I want to set up what's called a load case. But the first thing I want to do is set up what are called time history functions. I'll explain why in a minute. But we want to essentially load this frame over time. right? It's not just going to take this displacement and then just pull it out to whatever we want, but let's say five feet. We want to pull it over over some amount of time. So we can see, let's say, the development of the plastic hinges. We can see this behavior as it moves from this point to this point uh, dynamically. We just want to say, go here to here, and one step can be done. So we want to define functions that are based <coughs> over time. So I can define functions time history. In this case, I'll use a user function. Add a new function, and there's a couple things to note here. One is these 
software packages often have vibration and such inbuilt, which means if you apply a load very fast, you're gonna have lots of vibration of your members, unless you give them a lot of damping to, to take that out. So I really like to apply dead load over some amount of time. So in this case, I worked it out ahead of time that three seconds is good. So I want a time value of zero, zero. And then this is just something you're gonna scale later on. So you scale this by some intensity function. In this case, we'll scale it by the load you're going to apply. So in this case, I just want a straight line that starts at zero, at zero seconds, and then at three seconds is one. So it linearly ramps up here. But you can define whatever you like for these low cases. You can have sign curves. You can have all sorts of fancy stuff. So I'll just call this guy dead load. And then I also want to have the push occur over some certain amount of time as well. So I'll call this push. And instead of three seconds, I'm going to have this guy occur over 10. So I have these two essentially linearly ramping functions. So dead load and push. Now I can define what's called a load case. And you'll notice we have push in here by default. We can go ahead and modify this or add a new one if we like. You notice it asks you now for a load type. So static would be linear elastic analysis, essentially. And it's kind of single points. So you can have it actually be nonlinear as well, but a linear static analysis is just take this load, apply this load, and do it, let's say, from purely static's point of view. Right? You apply a load of 100 kips and you resolve something on a frame. There's no sense of time in that sort of analysis, like we do with the hand calc. We want, instead of time-based analysis, so we'll go down here to time history. And there's different loads in here, for, or different analyses for different types of things. Modal analysis would be related to um, the structural dynamic stuff. We kind of briefly touched on at the beginning of the class. Uh, accounts for multi-degree freedom systems. Don't want to spend too much time on that. We're interested in a time history analysis. You have two different ways of solving this time history analysis. You have modal and direct integration. Generally, direct integration is the better of the two, but it's also the more complex, and you can have convergence issues and stuff with this as well. Modal analysis is generally not recommended for anything outside of linear elastic because uh, Linear elastic modes are generally all the theories designed around. You get into nonlinear spaces and it starts to fall apart. So you can have all sorts of wonky stuff if you want to use nonlinear modal. So we're going to use nonlinear. This allows our plastic hinges to form. It's a nonlinear analysis. And we're going to use direct integration. So in the case of our frames, direct integration is like using the average acceleration method. So if you come down here to time integration parameters, You'll see all these different options. The one we went over was the Newmark beta method, the average acceleration method, which is defined as a Newmark method with a gamma of 0.5 and a beta of 0.25. So you can choose that integration scheme in here as well. So this will be doing like you did for homework too. You also have all these different ones you can look at as well. Hilbert Hughes Taylor, uh, in this case, with these parameters, is exactly equivalent to the Newmark beta method. So by default, SAP uses the constant average acceleration method. So we'll go ahead and leave it with that. We can also define damping for this frame. Damping's a bit quirky. I don't want to spend time belaboring this. Uh, you have constant damping. Um, you have Raleigh damping. SAP, by default, uses what's called Raleigh damping, which looks something like this. pick two uh, periods, and it comes up with a function essentially as this. So this has issues to do with stiffness formulation, but this is what SAP does by default. If you do a modal analysis, then you can tell each mode to have a certain level of damping. So in this case, reinforced concrete, we generally have a damping ratio of 0.5, or 0.05. So that's what I'll go ahead and use here. 
And I'm just going to use the defaults of 1 and 0.1 here as well. I'll show you how to calculate the natural period of the structure in a second. But we'll just assume those are good for now. So I'm now defined damping for this analysis. You can also include P delta here. Note that you may think it's just a simple click of a button. We talked about P delta last time. The computation time for this problem, let's say doing a normal earthquake, uh, took me about one minute to run this analysis with just a standard earthquake motion with no P delta. It took about 10 minutes to run with P delta. So your computation times can increase very, very significantly by doing this. Just a simple click. Or you can go really crazy and have large displacements, and then you can almost never converge unless you're really careful about what you're doing. So you may think, oh, I can just include these things really easily by clicking over here. You have to be very wary about including these nonlinearity parameters. They can cause all sorts of issues with your analysis and conversions. So, generally speaking, unless you have good reason to include p delta, and you're being very careful to consider lots of things that go wrong with that, you want to avoid it. So I'm just going to stay with none. I'm going to show advanced load parameters here, and this is where I can apply my loads at different points in time. So I'm interested in applying first my dead load. Right here, load pattern, dead load. My function I'm going to use the time history we call dead load. And my scale factor in this case is going to be 1. So it takes whatever dead load you have there. We said 20 kips per foot. You could scale that up to different values here. So you can make that 40 by including a scale factor of 2, let's say. I'm just going to leave it as a scale factor of 1. I put those in directly. Time factor is just 1. You can also scale the time over which things are applied. My arrival time is going to be 0. This is going to start at the very beginning of the load. First, I'm going to apply my dead load. I'm going to let this dead load settle on the frame. Vibration can get damped out. And then I'll actually start pushing it over. So I don't want any applying this load fast. It's vibrating when I start pushing it over while it's still vibrating. So we'll get erroneous results that way. So go ahead and modify this. I then want a second one. I'm going to look at my push case this time. I want to load this with the function push. I now want an arrival time of three seconds, because this is when we're going to start pushing. So I can modify. And my scale factor, I'm just going to pull this out to whatever uh, I want. In this case, we determined from hand count to this frame, this place is about 2.25 feet. So let's just say three feet. And we'll pull from the analysis of this when it actually hits that two point uh, whatever feet. But we'll just say three for now. I can now go add. So the last thing that you want to do is you want to define the number of output time steps. So in this case, I'm going to, let's say, get 50 per second, just for clarity's sake. And so I have a total of 13 seconds runtime. So if I just go to calculator, 13 divided by 0 0.02. I need 650 increments. So I do 650, 0 0.02. So this now will give me results for this frame. Every 0 0.02 seconds of it being pulled over. Okay. Let's go ahead and run this now. Advantage of using the hinge stuff versus using nonlinear elements. So you can also look at things at different points in time. Now, if we look at push, we go up to let's say frame moments and such. You can let's say look at time zero when there's no moments on the frame, and you can step through and look at how are moments increasing and so on, and so forth as you're applying, let's say your depth load. But we're really interested in looking at not just these individual points in time, but kind of looking at the full performance of this frame in general. So if I look at, let's say, eight seconds in the motion. So I'm just pulling it over. This will be five seconds in, about halfway. I can look at, let's say, the reactions that are forming in this frame. Oops, I realized I did something. We need to, oops, we need to 
unreleased the moments here. We did that from the pushover as we were going. Remember, we did release this partial fixity. We had released these members. And so we want to fix that. That's why that didn't look right. So now we want to read them. Sorry about that. So what you'll see actually in this case is you get these forces at the top of the members. They're essentially artificial. This is just from the displacement control. This is looking, let's say, eight seconds in. These forces essentially are what you want to look at for how much force is being applied to pull this frame over. Right? Because it's given a displacement, but it doesn't know how much force is required directly to generate that displacement. That's part of what it's solving for. So when you're fixing these, you're developing these reactions up here that are, are artificial. And you can see they exactly balance with the forces at the bottom here. So if you looked at the sum of forces in this case, you're going to get sum of forces equal to zero. And that's just because you're not applying a force here directly. You're reacting a force based off those displacements. So if I'm interested then in looking at what's the total force that's being applied to this frame at a given point in time, you're going to look at, let's say, this force plus this force. And you can look at the displacement of either one of the joints because the frames can be displaced in the same amount. There's no actual deformations here. So what you can do is you can first identify what these joints are. So if you right click on this guy, you'll see this joint has a label and it's given a number two. So every time the final element, uh, element is generated, each node is going to have a number associated with it. So you'll have joint one, two, three, fifty million. So you can look at results for a given joint. SAP saves all these results from big databases for analysis. So I'm interested in joint two. I want to know what's the force reacted at joint two. And this joint over here, joint four. So I'm interested in the forces at joint two and four, and let's say the displacement at joint two. So I can go up here to display, show plot functions. And now you can define plot functions. So I'm interested in adding joint displacements and forces. Adding plot function. It asks you for joint ID. I'm going to say joint 2. I'm interested in, let's say, the reaction in direction 1. F1 will be x. So I can now modify the name. I can call this force left. I can now add a second one. Instead of joint two, I'm interested in joint four. Reaction in X. This now. Force right. I want to add one more. I'm interested now in, let's say, the displacement in joint two. And notice you have uh, relative and absolute values in here. Uh, keep in mind, we talked about relative and absolute values in the very beginning when we were looking at um, average acceleration method. Did, let's say, the difference between absolute acceleration and relative acceleration. So you can look at, at all of those in SAP. And keep in mind, absolute displacements can be really wonky for finite element programs because they have no concept of space. So things can be floating at a million inches per second in SAP, and it doesn't know the difference sometimes. So it doesn't have this reference that this thing's, let's say, fixed on the ground, and the ground is the ground. Right? That's arbitrary <coughs> in, in kind of human thoughts. So you generally want to look at relative displacements exclusively in finite element packages, unless you have something where you're specifically looking at absolutes and you have some, some way you're anchoring your system. Because otherwise it can just fly off, off in space and all the relative results will be correct. So the relative values are all what they should be. But just kind of the absolute where it is in space, right? if you're applying, let's say, a force to something, F equals MA. So you get some acceleration and it can fly off in one direction. And even though it's moving like that, the relative motion is still all correct. So just keep that in mind. So we're interested in relative displacement. 
we can call this as a frame displacement. And so if you want to look at these, you can look at, let's say, the force on the left side of the frame versus time, if you like. You can see it looks something like this. You can also look at the force in the left and the force in the right together over time, what they both look like. This is what is really of interest to us. You want to combine these forces at, a, at every given point in time. But what we're really interested in is not so much force or displacement versus time, but force versus displacement. So you can also change the horizontal axis here. And instead of looking at left and right forces or time, I want to look at displacement. And so I get a plot that looks something like this. And now what I can do is I can actually export these results to Excel, let's say, and then add these two individually. So I can file, print tables to file. And you can save it somewhere. But what happened is you get a spreadsheet that looks something like this. So you have a bunch of different forces. So this gives me time right here. Displacement. This would be, let's say, left force, right force, and so So I'm manually just going to add these two together. So if you look at this column here, set paste the values. This is just this plus this. So when I do that, I can also put in what we got from our stuff by hand. This is from the hand analysis. And you'll see that I get something that looks like this. So I plot in both directions. You can see the blue and the red are identical to one another, right and off of each other. So this verifies that our pushover analysis I wanted to get into talking about earthquakes, but that's kind of another 45 minutes. So hopefully we'll have some time to talk about that before the class is over. Maybe the Monday after our next midterm. That's all I have for them today. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about setting up things in the analysis software and walk through it. Yes. So do we have a midterm on Monday? Yes, you do actually. Are we gonna go over what's been beyond it or pushover analysis? <laughs> I mean, we can talk about it if you like. What, do you have any questions on the midterm? I mean, it's going to be a pushover analysis, identical to the example and the homework. We're going to post the solutions. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to get a scan. I'll post the solutions tonight. Yes? Your lengths changed a little bit with the whole fix and pin stuff, and there was a you know, 360 inches, it was a 100, like that. It was the 30. The plastic hinge lengths. 30 feet or whatever. Yeah, I just didn't know how that, you know, I thought that was going to play in those.